um, have um, <clears throat> uh, beseeched, cajoled, tricked, um, <laughs> um, supplicated uh, Ming Wu to um, uh, spend some time talking about um, kind of whatever he wants. But we, we uh, uh, he made up a title about utter and inner chi, and the theme for this semester is the body. Um, but uh, you know, energy, body, chi could be whatever. Um, and um, in terms of disclosure, you know, I'll say is it not a conflict of interest. It's a it's a kind of confluence of interest. Uh, I met Ming Lu um, over forty years ago, and we're still in some sense here. And um, um, I, I've been a, a an overt and covert fan of his omnipresent work for many, many, many years. And um, um, if you read the bio on, on Ming Lu, that's just a, that's just a very s small bit. And he's sort of, in, in my sense, been there and done that, uh, both forward and, 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 and backward. And um, yeah, I'm just really happy that he's taken some time to come. And so without further ado, I hand it over to our dear friend Ming Lu. And welcome. Thank you. Uh, so you know my name? It's very odd <laughs> that I have a Chinese name. Uh, but uh, in the uh, 1970s, I was in Taiwan, uh, in fact, as a Buddhist monk, uh, but uh, met a Taoist teacher whose family name is Liu. Um, and trace their family lineage of Taoism uh, back to Han Dynasty, but I think legitimately Song Dynasty, um, and only teach members of their family. So in 1978, uh, I agreed to be adopted into his family to receive uh, teachings because his sons were all bankers and uh, <laughs> no interest. At all. Uh, unlike uh, most romantic notions of religious people, um, this family was extremely wealthy. <laughs> um, their house was one square meter smaller than the imperial palace. Because, and they measured it because it was against the law to build. The, um, and uh, when my teacher was young, uh, he lived in a mansion with. 450 people, but 150 of which uh, were family members, and the rest were servants. Um, and they maintained their wealth for about a thousand years, which included having four chapels in the family mansion. Um, so members of a priesthood, you might say, within the family existed. So. It has yet to been really recognized by the academic world about family lineages, both Confucian and Taoist family lineages that don't teach the public, that only teach each other because they know enough history to not trust anybody else inside the family. <clears throat> also, this was an effort to not to become too Chinese, which is to be too eclectic. And to say that they were a Taoist family, not a Chinese mixed up Buddhism, Taoism, Confucian family. Though, of course, uh, Confucianism was taught for literacy. So but once you were literate, there was a family um, tradition of literature as well, that the Leo family had more than 500 texts written by family members, not ever shared uh, in temples. So I received that kind of training um, for a short period of time when I was in Taiwan, but uh, ritually received a transmission of the entire family tradition, for uh, which for me was standing up all night, um, you know, for a week and a half. I wasn't really sure what was happening because the transmission was ritual, it was not explanation. So the following couple of years, I was able to organize a solitary retreat 
because it was quite frightening what was happening to me. <laughs> uh, I couldn't understand why anybody was doing anything or what people were talking about. Uh, after my solitary retreat, I was able to kind of figure out how to come back to the United States, how to relate to my experience by teaching traditional Chinese medicine. So I founded a school of traditional Chinese medicine, uh, La Vida. That was about 10 years. <clears throat> that made me a little more comfortable, and since then I've also been trying to teach from what I've learned um, through this transmission. So uh, that's what I'll talk about today. The fact that uh, I also spent uh, 40 years studying Tibetan Buddhism is just a sidebar. <laughs> Um, because uh, if I was to explain how they're connected, you'd be very surprised. <laughs> but that's another, another time we'll do that. Uh, today, you, you be invited back. Uh, people have asked me to talk about uh, the body, and uh, body in uh, Taoism. Um, first, I have to say that probably nobody really knows what the word Taoism means. It's a, it's a term coined by non Taoists. <laughs> It's just very odd when you think about it. Um, but, you know, Jesus was Jewish. So, of course, <laughs> it does make some kind of sense um, that uh, things get changed over time. People are given names, etc. If we were to understand the history, and I've spent more than 40 years studying Buddhist and Taoist history, um, history of it is that Taoism has still not defined itself yet. Um, it's had definitions given to it by outsiders, but it's actually never had a structure um, uh, that's self-defining. The closest we have to a self-defining uh, structure has been the Orthodox Taoist tradition, which is called the Qianshir Tao, which started about the uh, first century. Um, the training for that priesthood, which is the only term Taoist we have in Chinese, refers to an ordained priest. There are no hobbyists. It's an ecclesiastical tradition, and the training is about eight or nine years, um, and it's mostly for the performance of ritual. Um, but on my, in my personal experience of training in that way, uh, it's because any other sort of practice is private or secret, but actually private is a more sensible word. And that the public performance of ritual was the way in which it interfaced with society, which was largely confusion. So uh, there is that tradition, which is not 2,000 years old. The predicate for that tradition, or the, the ground for that tradition, is animistic shamanism. Uh, is the, popular way to talk about it now. And uh, East Asian shamanism has a particular flavor to it that's different from Central or South Asian or West Asian. Um, and it seems to have disappeared because uh, uh, the Confucian tradition decided to call them Taoists. And over a period of time, the style of education for those kinds of Taoists created Orthodox Taoism. Um, Orthodox Taoism is again a fantasy, but um, when Buddhism arrived, when other influences arrived, it adopted them wholesale because the attitude of Taoism in general, I think, is extremely eclectic. Um, it's kind of a what works kind of tradition. So um, many, many people have heard that there's some kind of connection between this uh, term Taoism and uh, Tai Chi, for instance, or internal martial arts. We also, you can't get a book on Chinese medicine without there being Taoism as used. In the introduction, everybody says there's connection, but nobody explains. <laughs> because nobody knows. <laughs> it's just nonsense. It's actually a British idea. Um, if we were to take the rituals of Orthodox Taoism and try to connect it up to California Taoism, for instance, there's, there's almost no connection whatsoever. However, we can still talk about something um, that has to do with the Taoist body, what the word Taoist body might mean. 
in Chinese, we don't really have any specific terms. All the specific terms used are Confucian terms. Um, and trying to translate them is really hopeless. <laughs> but uh, I think we can talk about um, the Western idea of the body, for instance. Everybody here is sitting in one, basically informed by a modern notion of what our physical body is. And it, what I call scientism, which is some kind of popular understanding of science, is the basis of your experience, of your physicalness. So maybe you like to take herbs when you're sick, but if it gets serious, you'll go to the hospital. <laughs> because that's the shrine of scientism, and that's the one we actually believe in. Yeah. So there is an actual alternative way of looking at uh, that, uh, what the Chinese idea of the body is, for instance. Um, but it's almost impossible to comprehend uh, if scientism is your belief system. Because then we have to apologize. So I am not very good at apologizing. <laughs> you know, the sort of Mickey Mouse science of the modern world. <laughs> I don't feel like I have to apologize that it doesn't match the science of a 3,000-year-old tradition of science, basically. So the basis of that science, um, uh, you know, the the practice of medicine and the understanding of the body during the Han Dynasty, the common, around the Common Era, the Roman version and the Chinese version were very similar. The main method of medicine at that time uh, was bleeding. <laughs> so basically, if you were sick, they figured out it was something in your blood, and so they basically stabbed you. Um, and waited for the bad blood to come out, and if the bad blood came out, um, then you got better. Yeah, so the Chinese were already doing this with very small needles, but still, bleeding was the main idea. The biggest distinction was the Chinese had already discovered circulation, um, and the Romans had special chairs so they could tip your blood out. <laughs> Um, and there are Roman medical documents that say that, you know, what happens when someone dies from the treatment and the doctors responded, they're unworthy Roman citizens. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where, the, that's where the break occurs. Because uh, when the Chinese looked at the same situation of bleeding someone to death, for instance, uh, they thought that there was something wrong with this. Uh, procedure, they also thought that perhaps it was only for strong people. And the Romans said, yes, it is only for strong people, and it will kill the rest, and that's good. It sort of cleans up Rome. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. uh, the AMA admits that 40% of the people who die in hospital die from treatment. So we're still there. We're still Roman in that sense. The Chinese thought um, the people who die quickly from these very strong treatments might be worthy um, because of their sensitivity to contribute to our society. So they tried to develop a medicine that would actually keep sensitive people part of the society. It's a huge, uh, this is research from Harvard Medical School, by the way. This, it's a very interesting, this breaking point, um, which is to say that uh, uh, weaker or weak people might in fact be sensitive. This is an extremely important idea in understanding the Chinese body. But the medicine of China is not just to bolster people to become stronger and stronger, bolster them, like have you know, cast iron immune systems. Philosophically, uh, that basically goes along with the world is a terrible place. Yes. 
Um, so the Chinese were already questioning this notion of the world as a terrible place, sometimes a terrible place, and not sometimes a wonderful place. Uh, this idea of yin and yang, you've all heard about. Um, there is this kind of an alternation in the world. It can't be characterized one way or the other. So that the healthy the term healthy has to be adaptable, not just strong. If you can't be weak at the right time, you also die. Not just strong, strong, strong will guarantee you a long life. So this is a very important uh, break with what I call West Asian medicine. Um, East Asian medicine took another turn. Um, the Turks were, would eventually find Roman medicine disgusting, but, <laughs> but uh, and were influenced. The first Chinese medical school to be built outside of China was built in Baghdad with the Chinese-speaking faculty, and that was in the seventh century. So there was an Easternization of West Asian medicine at that time. Uh, anyway, uh, so the body. First of all, uh, the idea of a human body. I think the biggest difference between uh, our contemporary notion um, and a kind of philosophical notion and then the, the Taoist notion is simply, is pretty simple to understand that uh, the Taoist notion of the body is largely um, rhythmic or related to time, not to substance or to space. I'll give you a minute. It's a very big idea. <laughs> um, the reason we take a pulse, for instance. Uh, is this uh, rhythm? And in traditional Chinese medicine, there's 12 of them, so is there are 12 rhythms that can be found related to organ functions. But more important, this, this is not a kind of childishness, but this is actually uh, what we actually are. We're a sort of rhythmic. The subject of, for instance, astrology and medicine, we're never really separated until communist times. Meaning that we have a constitution, uh, many kinds of medicine agree, everybody has some kind of constitutional base. And this is also natal astrology, associated with some kind of timeliness of when you were born. Um, and the kind of predilections or predispositions we have for illness and health are ancestral, meaning they come from some kind of past rhythm. But uh, that ancestral rhythm is now in a living body, which can act in various ways, which is in a process of transforming all the time. And so through choices, can actually eliminate the predisposition for the illnesses of the ancestors, and in some ultimate sense, uh, eliminate the predisposition for death itself. Because uh, rhythm doesn't actually end. You might say. <laughs> what goes up must come down. Do you know that uh, we're all sort of aware of this sort of rhythmic quality. Mom and Dad got in a bit of rhythm. There's <laughs> <laughs> a rhythm involved. Um, and there's a rhythm in our development um, prenatally, just exactly how much of our ancestral chi is, uh, uh, is used and discarded how much is kept. And then there's a series in the Confucian tradition, maturity comes in uh, seven and eight year cycles physiologically. And Taoists agree with that. Women in seven years, men in eight year cycles. 
in each one of these uh, rhythms or cycles, we're coping with two basic factors, an internal factor, um, which is this predisposition of our ancestors, and an external factor, which is the rhythms of the astrology or the time that we actually live in. So it's kind of like, you know, going to an open buffet. <laughs> the uh, almanac astrology, the astrology of the day, of the month, of the week, etc., is laid out for us. But uh, we walk along with the plate and take what our appetite causes us to be interested in. That appetite is ancestral. So this uh, ancestral qi and the, what's called chen qi, or a pure qi that's generated by heaven and earth, our, our environment. Um, this is you know, elaborately discussed in Bengal as a carmine. <laughs> but in the Chinese tradition, uh, we, we talk about it as uh, ancestral qi, or yuan qi, sort of original qi, and also the qi, or jia qi, the, the rhythmic qi of our environment and how we're interacting. We could say um, that our ancestral qi is a kind of capacity, and the jia qi, or the environmental qi, is a kind of opportunity. And that's what we are. We're a capacity relating to opportunity. Um, so, this idea that we're sort of a chemical skin bag of reactions kind of puts us out of the loop of understanding our own conduct, our own way in which this buffet is being <laughs> eaten, etc. So, we have modern people um, associating their thinking with scientism basically wait till they hit the wall and go to people that have a training that we don't have, and we let them do whatever they want. And I mean whatever they want. This used to be called in the Victorian time shamanism. <laughs> because we certainly don't know what they're up to, singing and throwing bones, uh, etc. But a Stanford MD now is pretty much in the same position, even has vestments little name tag, um, but we don't know what they're doing. And uh, it, they don't ask us about our experience. They are suddenly, because you've hit the wall with some very serious illness or injury, they're now the experts in your experience, etc. So this is very primitive, extremely primitive. Even if the machines go bing, <laughs> or even if there's lots of equipment, <laughs> rattles and skulls, whatever. Um, it's distracting because we are asked to not be in our experience. So I think the biggest, uh, biggest distinction we can make is this rhythmic quality that um, we perhaps uh, sometimes you feel confused about, uh, about your body or your physical condition, etc. But, but implied in your confusion is clarity. You have to know what clarity is to be confused. So you also have to know what healthy is to be sick. So contemplative traditions in general, uh, to a certain extent, the yoga tradition of South Asia and the uh, Nagong traditions of East Asia um, are really a practice to get into our experience, largely in a rhythmic pattern, meaning usually the breath is rather important. Um, because that's a fundamentally a rhythm we can't stop for more than four or five minutes. <laughs> and then we cease to be. So, um, Taoist ideas about what we should do during our lifetime is to be interested in the things we must do. Not that what prophets told us or 
great yogis told us, or insightful people, just what we must do. So maybe you think I might even be a nice person. But if I came across the room and held your nose closed and put my hand over your mouth, <laughs> it would only be a few moments before you would try to kill me to get me to stop what I'm doing, to get you to stop breathing. Even if I say it, you're already getting a little tense. This, this is really where we find Taoism. That's really why it's not uh, uh, easy to define. So, well, second to that, um, we need to eat. So, Taoism has a reputation for experimenting with what you assimilate, and digest. Um, sleep is very important. It's going to be probably a third of your life. So if it's just uh, how you waste your time in the evening, <laughs> for instance, uh, then that's not a practice of Taoism. Fourth is uh, to supposedly to reproduce you know, our system our basic system of breathing and eating generates blood. We circulate blood in order to generate zing, for which there's no English word. Some kind of quintessential predilection for physicalness. So, horny creates the species. So we are generating um, jing. We can have two purposes. One is to make junior. Uh, the other is to repair injury and illness. Yeah. Because if you think about it, junior usually looks like you. A little bit. <laughs> because your jing was also made to reproduce you. Um, so we all kind of have, you, know, you have your mom's eyes, but you have your dad's jaw. Kind of. <laughs> this is uh, uh, how we come into existence through two lines, yeah? yin and a yang line. Um, but then we are also, we generate jing. So for instance, if I cut myself, cut my body, all I've really done is, you know, like push cells away from each other. Um, and blood comes because um, this is kind of like a fire alarm. Blood comes to injury mostly for purification reason, to push out whatever is going in. You know. So it should bleed a little bit, it's okay. But if it continues bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and bleeding um, and doesn't stop, that's a condition of our jing. Because once the skin's broken, once the injury occurs, once the illness enters, then the jing drops into the blood and comes with the blood, um, and then starts reprogramming the cells. Uh, and if the jing is in very, very good condition, it reprograms them exactly the way they were when there's no scar tissue. Scar tissue is faulty jing memory. So this is interesting because uh, now in China, I would say if you're going to have surgery, you should go to China because you do a much better job than we do here. And one of the reasons they've changed and adapted uh, some of the surgical procedures is to not create scar tissue. This is like polite Western medicine from a Chinese point of view. <laughs> you don't want to give anybody any scars because it kind of inhibits your future inhibits your ability to uh, recover from any illness afterwards. Yeah, kind of thing. So, uh, actually one of the first times I ever saw acupuncture was in Chinatown, San Francisco in the 60s, and the uh, doctor um, was inserting needles at both ends of a scar, manipulating them so that it turned pink. He could do about a quarter of an inch a day scar tissue would disappear. 
because he could regenerate the tissue. Um, and so this idea of you know the, what we're made of, this rhythmic breathing, rhythmic eating, because we eat, we assimilate, and we eliminate. This is also a rhythm. If we do that badly as well, then our blood is not very healthy. Okay. If we overnourish ourselves, which is pretty much the case in the United States, um, then we, we're not eliminating um, quickly enough. So the nutrients turn to toxins. So it's very rhythmic. It's very simple. Everybody can understand this. Yeah. You don't need to go to medical school to understand this basic idea. <laughs> um, yeah. And if we eat uh, combinations of nutrients, because we're hysterical about nutrients, and they don't digest or assimilate properly, then we're in fact just, it's another version of fat, unhealthy, et etc. Et so, um, Again, back to the, the notions of how Chinese medicine developed out of this Taoist process. Taoism has many, 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 many streams in it, um, which is why they haven't self-defined. Because to include everybody who says they're Taoist, it just challenges the notion of definition. But the one that we can talk about today that was uh, really helping Chinese medicine define what the body was, was a tradition of Nedan, or the tradition of alchemy. It existed before the first century, but it got cataloged by ecclesiastical Taoists starting in the first century. It already had history, we know, from classical literature that came before Taoism. But Taoists were the ones that preserved the books. They also generated the largest religious canon on earth, which were commentaries on commentaries on commentaries. This is mind-boggling. It's taken European scholars four generations to make the index. <laughs> Brill has now published the, I don't know, hundred volume index of the Tao Tan. <laughs> um, because uh, there is no definition about where this is supposed to be going. This is not, it's not like a collection of salvational tricks. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a collection of you know, enlightenment paraphernalia. It's whatever you want to talk about related to the sort of fundaments of our experience. So ecclesiastical Taoism has been like the librarian of many, many streams. And one of those streams eventually finds its way into the 4th, 5th century when doctors appear um, in some modern sense, an actual physician, someone who is training and daily life is routinely helping sick people. Uh, many of them were um, sort of Dallas College dropouts. This is the, this is the only way to explain um, when I was living in Taiwan, in the hermitage there, um, because the, uh, the whole island found out that a couple of the hermits had come out of a retreat, there were anywhere from 20 to 30 people at the gate every morning um, with their doctors. Surgeons and modern doctors as well as traditional doctors, as well as transmedium doctors, and et cetera, who couldn't help their patients would line up um, for these hermits who have little or no medical training, but could actually look more simply at what was going on with the patients. At the beginning, I thought they were geniuses. <laughs> at the end, I realized their genius was that they didn't see any of the details. They just saw the essential quality. Um, and so the older ones would spend you know, 20 minutes or so doing this, um, just giving advice to the first ten, and then go back <laughs> into their huts. Um, but there still is, even in modern China, this still this notion of a connection between these contemplative hermits and this idea of medicine. Not, not embarrassing to anybody, it, it's just that if you're not a physician, you shouldn't really have to do this. Um, 
the communists found this connection to be inscrutable and superstitious because of their training in Paris, basically. <laughs> so uh, it was, uh, most of these people were either rounded up and actually murdered, um, or some escaped. But it isn't that they really were going for being doctors. Their use of Jing, for instance, was to reverse, uh, not create junior, but reverse Jing, um, and therefore be able to experience their, you might say, experience their life um, without any predilection for illness and death. And it, uh, it might sound really uptight, but it's not uptight at all. It's just if you want to do it, that's all. It's just if you want to be a bus driver. It's the same. You just want to do it is good enough. You can do it. Uh, I think in America we want everything to be a sort of Quakerism, isn't it? some kind of <laughs> popular venue. It's not popular. It's never been popular to be Taoist in China. And to be a Taoist parishioner is close to meaningless in terms of religious experience, especially the farmers go for the festivals. If, uh, and if the crops are not growing well, they ask the priest to do a ritual, and they say yes, that's all. But this relationship is also true in sh uh, animistic shamanism. It's the old work. Um, so we now, in present time, are uh, just like the yoga tradition is totally degenerate, the Chinese uh, Nadan tradition is also what I call uh, gray-haired qigong and leotard yoga <laughs> have uh, make us imagine that we've discovered something, but uh, probably not, <laughs> since all those people will probably be uh, scientism oriented when push comes to shove. Kind of thing. Um, so, um, in some odd sense, we're all practicing this. Um, many people without any kind of guidance or using magazine articles on nutrition or something. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. We have a lot of guides available but it's not very um, thorough. So the lineage, the idea of lineage, which is hysterically important in the whole of Asian tradition, um, is basically just you know, bringing forward a momentum of experiments. In Taoism, it definitely is not revelation. It's science. It's bringing forward recorded and documented experiments, um, standardizing them but understanding that standardizing would never lead to any kind of ultimate truth. So you have to keep bringing it forward. So lineage isn't just to the past. It's also anticipating what's coming up. So the, to imagine, for instance, that uh, Taoism should now you know, give, it, give its teaching to science. Or something. It's, it's, uh, not, the time is not at all right. <laughs> It's like letting precocious four-year-olds go to grad school. It's not, the, the connection has not yet been made. The science of uh, these older traditions uh, is decrepit, for one thing, and not many people interested, so it's very, very slim and it's surviving right now. On the one hand, and on the other hand, there's no actual interest. everybody's interest is sort of based on uh, superficiality and vanity. Um, somebody asked me once why I never brought my Taoist teacher to the United States, besides the fact that he passed away before he probably would have come, but um, I asked him only once, and he said uh, he understood that <laughs> I came from a country that's mostly ghosts, so he didn't, he really didn't have um, teachings for ghosts, but, but he was going to network with some of his friends who were expert with ghosts to sort of help me out. <laughs> and here you were. 
Yeah, and I, I brought one here. I should tell that story. Everybody loves stories. Um, sort of a lineage cousin of my teacher. We brought him here. Um, and the idea was that he would speak to various audiences informed about supposedly Chinese medicine, but also some people just informed, like cancer researchers. Stanford were all over me about bringing this guy to talk to various audiences. Um, so at one point, we went to a cancer research center out over the hills, somewhere in the real California. I don't remember where it was. Um, but we were driving in, and uh, he was kind of a bumpkin from rural Taiwan. And never been on an airplane before, and never, never, never stayed in a hotel before. <laughs> so we were driving into the parking lot, and this is a research center that had a parking lot for about 400 cars. So he immediately got disoriented, saying, you know, it's this an automobile manufacturing place. And I said, no, it's a cancer research. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he wouldn't get out of the car. And he said, what are people doing here? And I said, well, they're researching a disease which is really rampant in the United States. And he said, no, you, no they aren't. Uh, I hadn't really thought this would play in the whole game. <laughs> we were already late, so I was kind of a little frantic. And, uh, so, <clears throat> sure, I think with the people you're going to meet, you know, will be very open to what it is you have to say. He said, "This is a temple of a demon." He said, "Amazing how many gifts this demon has given." You know? This, what he meant by gifts was offerings. Mm -hmm. So the offerings come from all over your country. Please take me to the airport. This is like this is beyond my ability to cope. And I actually said, please get me away from this place. Uh, I only knew him a little bit before I left Taiwan, so I was pretty confused. But as we were driving away, he made a determination that he was canceling the rest of his time in the United States and he wanted to be taken to the airport. Um, he'd been, he said he'd been warned and he was really sorry um, <laughs> that he needed to go. And I said, well, you know, some of the audiences you might find you know, are really very sympathetic. And he said, oh, there's many kinds of ghosts. <laughs> Not all unfriendly. Some very friendly. But to take all your jing, take all your energy, and take all uh, with a big smile. <laughs> Said so. Please, the airport. So he spent some time changing his ticket and he left. Um, just. Uh, you know, I have a few teachers who've had that, not just Taoist, but Buddhist teachers as well, who think that um, the level of our open-mindedness um, is a self-trance, um, vanity, and all we want is you know, jumping monkeys. You know, really, we really have no intention of practicing or no intention of doing what they say. So. It takes a very courageous teacher to go among so many ghosts. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I have I have blue eyes, so I I actually think I understand what he means. Um, the ghostly quality. When I was being trained as a Taoist priest, we had this. You know, there was a reference book for sixty-four thousand different kinds of ghosts. <laughs> Luckily, it's falling into categories, so you could possibly make use of this manual. Um, but all of them, uh, at various stages, have mudras and sounds and food and fragrances that transform them, etc. But even though this man who came was grand master of this kind of tradition, <laughs> he just wanted to go home. Um, and he said that there were visions in the past of um, cities, uh, uh, ghosts that look like humans, and that they would be uh, um, 
look like uh, glistening cubes or glistening, uh, you know, crystals, skyscrapers, basically, um, and that people would act like insects, um, and that they would lose their humanity in the process, and then there would be, uh, there would have to be some kind of new teaching because the humanity is gone, the lineage is based on having human students. So, uh, whenever I talk about, uh, you know, for instance, I talk to lots and lots of audiences about medicine. Um, and it's nice that people dedicate themselves to the study of medicine to help other people. I think it's a great idea. At the same time, it's never really been proven that anyone dies from illness. But we, all of us already know you died because you were born. You know, <laughs> you know the actual cause of death is birth. Uh, the cause of death from illness is actually exaggerated. And in modern times, that exaggeration makes us ghost-like. Mm. We don't think we're participating in our own creating of illness because we think illness comes when you get old, to take you out. But as it turns out, just getting old takes you out. And really, you don't have to be old either. You could be miscarried. Yes. So just coming towards death, you can experience, uh, coming towards life, you can experience death. So it's of interest. I, I think unlike uh, the South Asian and the West Asian traditions, the uh, Taoist tradition has a particular interest in this, and physiology that they practice. It's not been given up for some uh, transcendental experience. Again, it, I think the emphasis on uh, practice as a human set of activities, not a celestial mimicry, not imitating superhumans or imitating gods, but actually using your humanity to its fullness. So this is also a, a symptom of health. That the Confucian tradition provides wonderful, absolutely wonderful teachings on what it is to be a human being. And yet uh, many people read that now and think it's old fashioned or insignificant, or uptight, or strict, for instance. Well, as it turns out, being a human is a bit strict. <laughs> Just a bit. I mean, not a lot. But uh, it is a little bit strict. If we don't act for, if we have human uh, physiology, we have human ancestors, we can't work against it. We can obstruct it, etc. It's a possibility. So if we read about early Taoist uh, fruition, what's the fruition? Because uh, Taoists are all um, die. <laughs> Experiencing immortality doesn't mean not dying. Um, so, and in many cases, they weren't very big contributors. <laughs> I mean, they didn't come into town and you know, prove medical procedures. Though many did, actually, but, uh, uh, but most of them didn't. They didn't try to improve the political system, though some did. Um, but this uh, deathlessness, um, interesting idea. Um, if we were to look at, you know, what motivates us to do things, for instance. If we didn't have death coming, you know, that sort of terminal death, this uh, unknown, for instance, we're pretty weak in our interests. <laughs> so is it weak or is it becoming sensitive? 
that's the question. So it's weak if we don't uh, participate in some kind of human activity, some kind of. So Taoism traditionally has been discreet on what that activity is, and Confucianism has been public. They are, in some sense, the front and back of the same tradition. And generally speaking, literacy and, uh, you know, in the best of times, China has been about 8 to 10 percent literate. So those people who are actually able to read, etc., all would have learned to read by reading Confucian classics. So if they go off to study Taoism, they have learned to read or write by reading all the classics of Confucianism. So they have some idea about what it is to be a human being. So Taoist doctrine d does not contain this strictness or this parameters, for instance. Even my Taoist teacher, who was concluded a 21-year retreat uh, when I showed up, <laughs> when I told him that I was working on a translation of the Tao Te Ching, he said, where did you get it? He, he wasn't, he just wasn't, he couldn't believe that we had it in the United States. And I said, well, no, and not only that, but it's been translated a hundred times into English. He said, I hope not many people have read it. <laughs> I read it, uh, you know, in comparative, uh, comparative religion, I think, in freshman year at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, that was, no, actually, my brother came home from Harvard with the first textbooks he got in his freshman year. I read all of his textbooks. One of them was uh, D.C. Lau's translation of the Tao Te Ching, which I still think is pretty good. Um, and he was, he was shocked. So I said, so I'm sure we've been, because uh, you've studied it? He said, I'm not old enough yet. At that, at that time, <laughs> he was 72. Um, he said, and uh, he didn't understand why people thought it was important in Taoism. He said, uh, primarily it's for the altar, he said. It's an icon. Um, he said, unless you receive the transmission of it, along with it, and it's unreadable. Um, and he said that the you know, Confucian commentaries don't have the transmission, so it's become a literate work, you know, a kind of literati work. Um, a lot of the meanings of the characters have changed from their original meaning to governance in its Confucian interpretation, but those characters is what he went over with me. Uh, what those characters actually mean that supposedly refer to governance, but they actually don't. <laughs>